ranting about how I'm using old survey records um, in my PhD project. So just to outline what I'll be talking about today, um, firstly I'll be briefly introducing the topic in question. I'll be explaining what Iron Age rocks are and where to find them. Um, I'll be uh, showing you the free sites in Shetland that I'm researching. I'll be going through the methods that I'm using for the project, in particular how old survey records are being used. And then lastly, I'll be discussing some of the findings um, from using old records that I've noticed so far. So, just an introduction to the project. Um, its overall aim is to improve our understanding of Iron Age people who lived in southern Shetland um, in the Iron Age. And I want to look at existing records and the current condition of these archaeological sites. So these are called Musa, Yalsof and Old Skatness. So to do this, I'll be looking at the remains of the architecture um, on the structures using digital documentation. So the main techniques I'm using are terrestrial laser scanning and structure from motion photogrammetry. Um, also, I'll be looking at old survey records. So these vary quite a lot, ranging from older, earlier laser scans, um, photos taken for consolidation and record purposes, uh, way back to very old um, plan and survey drawings done back in the 19th century. Essentially, I want to uh, develop an extended biography for all three of these sites, and to look at how weathering on stone um, can show you uh, indicators where people moved across the sites and used different parts of these structures. And also, I think it'll help me to look at how the dry stone build was constructed and created, and it'll give me an idea of whether the techniques were shared across the three different sites, or whether um, we can actually find evidence of whether the same builders were building different parts of the walls on all of these areas. Um, the sites themselves, they've also they've changed a lot since the Iron Age, and technically they still are used today because they're all open to the public. So visitors, are, they are visitor attractions and people can still come to see them. So um, there's been lots of evidence of consolidation and conservation across time. Um, so there's been different practices that have been taking place since the uh, late 19th century, so good and bad, so I want to look at all of these. And essentially, uh, um, this will help the project's partners to develop, develop um, better uh, site management practices, um, because all of them are on the UK's uh, tentative list for world heritage status. So, just an introduction to Brocks. So I think, um, in a nutshell, the best way to describe them is by calling them prehistoric dry stone towers, or roundhouses. Um, they're circular, and they have some key, uh, unique architectural features. Uh, the main one being these massive double walls that you can see on this reconstruction drawing. Um, because of their monumental nature, they've often been interpreted as elite strongholds, um, but this is very debatable. And they were originally built in, in the Iron Age, so roughly between 400 to 200 BC. Um, but there's also much uh, evidence of later reuse in the Iron Age and in later periods as well. And they're only found in Scotland. So as you can see on this distribution map, they are mostly la located towards the north of the country, uh, across the Atlantic region. And the three sites that I'm looking at, they're located in Shetland, so they're towards the very far north of the, the British Isles. And the sites that I'm looking at, they're all based in southern Shetland, so you can see Old Skadis and Yaltov are at the very, very southernmost tip of the mainland, and Musabrock is located on the now uh, uninhabited island of Musa, just a couple of kilometres to the north. So why am I looking at these three sites? Well, Musa is a really special case in itself because it is the best preserved brock in the whole wide world. And you can see on the picture on the right hand side, um, that's the site as it is today. It still stands to uh, 13 metres high and you can still go inside it. As you can see on the image on the left, that's me and the survey team from Historic Environment Scotland last year surveying it with the ZNF Imager 5016 laser scanner. Um, the site's really important because it stood since the Iron Age, it was recorded in Viking sagas, and the first archaeological survey was done way back in 1855 by Sir Henry Dryden. So we've still got his survey and uh, survey drawings and that can be used today. Uh, since the early 20th century, it's been under state guardianship, so the Scottish government has been recording the site since those times, and we've got all of these records. Uh, my second site, Yalsov, um, is very different to Musa. You can see from the aerial photographs here, um, only half of the brock actually survives. So you can see that as the hemisphere at the bottom of the right-hand photo. Um, 
The prehistoric remains, they were only discovered in uh, 1897 by its then landowner, and in the early 20th century there was a series of different excavations that happened across lots of different areas of the site. So you can see what you see today is a massive palimpsest of lots of different periods ranging from the Iron Age uh, remains, so you've seen the Brock and the later Iron Age wheelhouse to the left of it on the right hand image, and then you've also got some later, later Norse Viking farmsteads and uh, a uh, later medieval laird's house as well. So you can see on this uh, diagram that uh, we really do have quite a mixture. Uh, I think that's quite challenging to present archaeologically to the, uh, to the public um, because when you go into the site you see everything at once. Um, so that's quite interesting to look at. Um, but, uh, the areas I'm looking at in particular are highlighted in the blue outlines. So you've got the wheelhouses, Brock and Courtyard and the Iron Age settlements. And last but not least, I'm also looking at Old Skatness. Uh, so this site is very different to the other two because it has a very different history. It was completely unknown until 1973 when it was accidentally discovered um, by a digger which clipped into the side of the brock by accident. Um, and the site, in, con in contrast to the other two which have been investigated by antiquarians, um, this site it was fully excavated by a team from the University of Bradford and Shetland Immunity Trust from 1995 to 2006. So in contrast to the other two sites, what we've got here is a full um, modern up-to-date archaeological record. So we've got plan and survey drawings, uh, we've got the photographic archive and all of the different find locations, so this is quite different. Um, in, in terms of the structure and alignment of the site, it's quite similar to Yalzov because as well as the central brock that you can see on the image on the left, um, you've got later Iron Age wheelhouses um, going all the way around the site as well. Also, there's, un uh, un there's also some unexcavated archaeology beneath these structures today, um, so that's quite important in terms of conserving the site. So, um, I'm using old survey records for a few different reasons. Um, I think I'd like to just list the five main ones today. Um, so these range from detecting changes and the movement of stonework across time uh, from the Iron Age to present. Um, importantly, because Old Skatnes and Yalsov were excavated by archaeologists, we have these records and it'll be quite interesting to look at the sites as they were being um, excavated to look at these re records digitally. Um, also, I want to look at the different um, patterns and, and the shape and build between the different structures and sites. I want to see how these are similar. Uh, I want to recognise where historic consolidation has been taken place and why. And lastly, I want to monitor the uh, condition of the sites for, uh, and the levels of erosion and weathering that have taken place there. So, in addition to looking at these old records, I have been producing new laser scan and photogrammetric data in a series of new surveys that took place last year and I'll be going back again this summer. And I think these are really useful records as well because they're producing very high, highly detailed information about the sites in their current condition um, without physically touching or damaging the sites. Um, so I can use this, for example, to look at wear marks on the stone and, and to determine whether these were archaeological. So I'm using that to compare to the old, uh, scan, da uh, old scan data and survey data. So uh, one of the ways that I'm doing this is by looking at how the stone has been placed and moved across time. Um, so this rather uh, jazzy picture on the left, that's, um, that's a, the registered laser scan data set uh, looking at the very central internal area of Musa Brock. Um, that's taken from last year's uh, surveys and the image on the right hand side is a photo taken from 1930. And what you can see there, if you look at the stonework, is on the whole not much has changed, but um, you can pick up some certain um, key differences. For example, the central um, water trough in the middle of the site, you can see that in the 1930s it seems to have been filled up a bit more with gravel, whereas nowadays it's completely empty. Um, so it'll be quite interesting to track these kinds of changes. Um, this is another nice example here. So this is the same image just zoomed out. Um, so on the uh, right hand side, that's our survey from 2017, fully registered. And it's quite nice to be able to compare this to earlier um, drawings as well. Because if you do this, it's is quite fun, um, you can overlay the earlier records onto the, these most recent records that I've been producing, which are arguably the most accurate to date. And you can see that um, they did a pretty good job in the uh, 1940s, um, but there are some key areas where you can see the survey drawings are not 
quite the same as what's actually on the site. So I think that's really interesting. Um, also, I'm looking at, as I mentioned before, how the sites looked like when they were being excavated. Um, and while I was doing this, um, I found some quite interesting um, information. So, for example, Structure 12 at Scatness, um, while it was being excavated, a researcher called um, Richard Barton looked at the stonework and he was able to produce some stereo stereophonic um, interpretations of the site. And he noticed that the stonework and the building style uh, changes halfway up this wall. So that's quite interesting, and it's uh, that's something that I'll be wanting to look into a bit more. Um, also, I mentioned that I want to be looking at the uh, similarities between these three different sites. Um, so when Structure 21 was excavated at Ulskatnes, and that's this image on the right here. Um, they found that it had a medial wall that runs all the way through the centre of this roundhouse. Um, this is quite interesting because uh, a very similar feature is shared at Yaltov. Um, this photo I took last year, and you can see this one it was taken in 1938. You can see on the whole, the site hasn't changed at Yaltov very much, um, but it'll be really exciting to look at how the stonework on these, across these two different sites is similar and by, by, uh, by looking at the earlier excavation photos I really want to see whether you can actually see similar patterns of stone placement across these uh, different sites. And I think one of the main reasons why this archive information is useful is to look at how the sites were historically consolidated because I think that gives us really interesting insights into changing attitudes um, in conservation practice through time. So way back in the, uh, the 1820s, uh, Musa Barak was heavily conserved and it was uh, and um, the doorway was massively expanded um, to allow easier access into the centre of the rock. Um, so you can see that on this uh, photo taken in 1919. Now, when the site uh, was taken into state guardianship, um, the conservators thought that this uh, was not true to the archaeology, so they decided to lower uh, the entranceway considerably, as you can see in these before and after shots. And you can see that today um, it hasn't been changed since that time. Um, so that, I think that's quite interesting to see how um, these different ideas of what it is to be um, representing the true archaeological um, site that is. Um, so I mentioned before, I'm also looking at uh, monitoring erosion and weathering, and this really will help the PhDs and external partners um, to locate areas that are particularly um, heavily weathered. Um, so in this photo, you can see what I've done is overlay the the uh, site plan from the excavations in 2003 of Old Scatness across the laser scans that we did back in, uh, in 2017 of uh, the site of Old Scatness. So I haven't really had a chance to do much of this yet, but I want to look into this in a lot more detail to see where changes have been taking place. I think that'll be really interesting. And I'm going to be doing the same uh, for the other two sites. So especially in the case of Musa, we also have earlier laser scan data from 2002 up to 2010. So it'll be quite interesting to see how the, uh, the bulk of the site um, has changed over that time. Um, and you can see from these drawings done way back in 1855 um, to 1946, um, the bulge towards the entranceway is nowhere near as pronounced as it seems to be today um, from these uh, scans that we took um, last summer. Um, so I think I just wanted to conclude by kind of talking about some of the issues that I've been stumbling across while I've been looking at all of these older data sets. Um, I think the key issue I've found is data compatibility, um, especially for laser scan data. So I've been using like a cyclone for um, managing and registering my new data sets. Um, but I found by trying to look at all the old databases, um, it's actually really, really difficult. Um, you, have, you can't easily migrate old data sets across to the new versions. And that's particularly troublesome when you don't have access to the raw data as well. And for some reason, some of that has been lost, and that's quite a problem. Um, and it does emphasize the fact that we really need to improve um, our archiving and also to make a really good um, set of metadata for um, when you're creating your data nowadays, especially to consider when someone wants to reuse your data, um, and also to maybe notify what your workflow is again, So, because what I'm doing at the moment is trying to puzzle out what people have done to their data, because I have no record of that, um, so that's been quite tricky. 
Um, but what's quite exciting is I've been, uh, I've literally just been experimenting with this in the last few weeks, so unfortunately I haven't had many um, very detailed results to show you, but uh, what I did was I put some earlier um, consolidation photos uh, of old scat nests through Agisoft Photoscan. Uh, so these were done in the early 2000s, so they're low quality JPEGs, but I had over 600 of them. So I wanted to see what you got out of it. And what you get is that, that tiny little area t to the left hand side, which isn't very good, unfortunately. However, excitingly, I put all of this data through um, uh, an open source uh, SFM software called Colmap. And I didn't do anything differently to the other photos, but you can see that the result looks a lot better. And that's just the biggest chunk as well. I've got more information about that. But I need to put it all together, so that's the next stage. And so that, look, that looks quite promising. So it's interesting, you're seeing different um, variations in quality from different software packages. Um, so I guess just to summarise, um, I found there's lots of different issues in using existing survey records. Um, however, there is a large amount of them, and there are also in a lot, uh, large variety of formats, uh, differing for each of these three sites. And I think that that in itself is quite useful because it's giving us an indicator of different attitudes to site recording through time and history. And it's kind of charting the course of changing opinions in archaeological preservation uh, from the early 19th century uh, to present. Um, so I think that overall, the old and the new data sets, they're both contributing to an extended biography of the uh, three sites, um, for their construction, use, disuse, rediscovery, to their current presentation to the public. Um, so I guess I kind of want to end it there. So um, I'm one year into a three and a half year project, so you can see there's a lot more to go, but um, hopefully I'll be doing a lot more analyses this year, so maybe by this point next year I'll have a lot more to present. Thank you very much.